Welcome to Mental Health News Radio. I'm your host, Kristen Sinanta Walker. Just what are we going to discuss? The intimacy that is mental health. Let's continue to make it as comfortable as discussing brain health or heart health. This show has been on the air for several years and we have amazing co hosts. And then we created a network of podcasters on mentalhealthnewsradionetwork.com, a place where every possible facet of mental well being can be talked about openly. My show, after several hundred interviews, the format is this intimate, deep, funny, touching, sometimes uncomfortable, but always vulnerable conversations with interesting people. The goal is to have you, our listening family, many of you who have become my good friends, feel as though you are listening in on private conversations. Thank you for tuning in and becoming part of this amazing journey with me and now with our network of podcasters. Just knowing this podcast might be helping any of you realize you are not alone on this journey called being a human being makes doing this podcast worth every second. Dr. Stephanie Kreisberg, thank you so much for coming on Mental Health News Radio. Well, thank you for having me, Kristen. I am really thrilled to be here. Absolutely. And just so everyone realizes, you know, we are in the midst of the COVID-19 outbreak. And what's interesting about that is I can make that statement knowing that everyone on the planet that listens will know what the heck I'm talking about. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. We are all in this together. Exactly. And so I am not working from a studio. I'm working from home. So if you, and I live on a farm. So if you hear dogs barking, horses in the background, it's because I'm doing what I'm supposed to do working from home. <laughs> right, and same here. So you may hear my dog barking or some children playing in the yard next door. So you know, that's how we're living. Exactly. It's been interesting to see all of these, uh, you know, TV people that um, are working from their laundry room or wherever. So Stephanie, with what's going on right now in the world, as you just said, you've been working from home and I am as well. And so we'll have, we'll have those interruptions. That's right. And it's part of life. And it's part of all adjusting to in terms of, of managing this um, enormous change and managing our anxiety, and which is part of what we're going to, you know, talk to, right. talk about Exactly, today. exactly. So our listeners know a little bit about your background, and we're going to get into a topic that is the most downloaded on the network. But first, let's start with the anxiety. Um, you're working with children and teens and adults with anxiety. So how have you been managing, you know, your clients right now with everything that's going on? Um, Well, that's a, that's a great question. I have switched over to telehealth, which means seeing people on an online secure platform. Mm -hmm. And um, I already saw a few people that way, people who lived too far from my office to travel regularly. Um, but for a lot of people, you know, that's all, all new. And I'm, I have to say, I'm so grateful. Everybody's been so patient with, you know, adjusting to some of the glitches with that. Right. And, you know, really talking to people, um, you know, especially, you know, kids and teens, you know, with where they're at with this. And everybody's had really different reactions. Uh, I- Yeah, I'm noticing people that just on our network of podcasters that are all, you know, people that work in the mental health field, whatever their uh, go-to way of managing anxiety is, it's definitely heightened for obvious reasons right now. And so it's been really interesting to, like I I had three apology texts this morning from different podcasters. I'm sorry we were freaking out. They were freaking out about something that they normally would never freak out about Mm -hmm. and really putting pressure on me to fix something that isn't mine to fix. And I had to sit back. I I mean, at first I was irritated, like, Hey, I'm going through this too. And then I had to remember, Oh, that's just them, you know, going to DEF CON one or something that they normally would be at DEF CON five about because everyone is stressed. Mm-hmm. That's right. And for instance, I, um, 
you know, I kind of have two parts of my practice. I work with people who are in relationships with narcissists, and then I treat anxiety disorders. So for example, you know, one teen I work with, she has OCD, and she has, um, you know, fears of germs and contamination. Right. So as you can imagine, that is, that's like a, like I said to her, that's like a big juicy steak for OCD. Yeah. She just loves the corona. Her, you know, fears of contamination are just escalating. So, you know, we've had to talk about how can she address her OCD? What is she going to, often we talk back to OCD. And so you can put it in perspective. And she came up with some really good things on her own. Being able to tell herself, you know, OCD is not a doctor. I'm not going to listen to you, OCD. Um, (laughs) Right. That has to be difficult. I think, um, let me ask you this. I have a question for you about that. If, if is, is a symptom or a behavior of OCD um, feeling the need to tell someone else exactly how to do everything? Um, well, sometimes, often with OCD, there's many different variations of OCD. It is not, it does not come, it's not one-stop shopping. There's many different types or subsets. So there is a need to confess, um, a need to say I did something wrong. Okay. Um, so that could certainly be a variation because you're so worried about things. Um, did you do this? Did you lock the door? Did you um, turn off the coffee pot? Things like that. Did you right. do this just right? Because people with OCD are very concerned about things being done just right or things going wrong. Because if you don't do things just right, something bad could happen. So often what seem like honestly annoying behaviors are, or frustrating behaviors are really what's going on is an OCD fear. Okay. Does that make sense? It totally make it makes absolute sense. I've I've had people that I know have OCD that um, and and someone new in my life just really overdoing it with the telling me how to take care of my horse, telling me how to take care of this, telling me. And to me, it sounds like complaints. But I know being in the field, okay, this is their OCD coming out probably more now because of what's going on in the world. Mm-hmm. And so my level of irritation can be abated by I me mean, practicing patience and going, they probably aren't this way when this kind of stuff isn't going on in the world. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. So there's could be so many different fears though um, about what could happen if you don't do this, you know? So, right. Right. Um, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And what an interesting juxtaposition to have treatment with people over their anxiety and then also treatment with their dealings with narcissistic abuse. That's, that seems perfectly, um, you know, in the same cup on, of how to manage things. How did you come to those two very different, but certainly symptomatic one from the other of of things? Mm, Great question. Well, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. I've been in practice, um, you know, over 25 years as a a psychologist here in Concord, Massachusetts, which is um, outside of Boston. And I started out working with kids and teens and adults. And I, I focus on anxiety disorders, although you know, as any clinician knows, people come in with all sorts of things and may think they are having an anxiety disorder, but but something else could be going on. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, in the course of my practice and my own life, I started to notice patterns of narcissism in my own family and how they were affecting me. And so, you know, at one point, you know, quite a number of years ago now. Um, and I'll, I'll just tell this story because I think it, it, it helps. I Sure. People, that's their favorite thing is when they hear people talk about their own life experience with this. Yeah. So feel free. Yes. My own journey. I came upon a wonderful book, which maybe a lot of your listeners have heard of, called Will I Ever Be Good Enough? Mm-hmm. Healing the Daughters of Narcissistic Mothers by Carol McBride. And she's a psychologist in Colorado. 
And I read that, and that was really so helpful to me. And so then eventually she offered a model. Um, she offered training for therapists. And I really felt that my combination of having worked with families and kids for so long and, you know, my own experience and learning would be a really good fit for helping people who have narcissists in their lives. Right. So I did the training. And I'll tell you, Kristen, it was really surprising. Once I completed the training and put it out on my website that I was available to help people with narcissists in their lives, particularly daughters of narcissistic mothers, honestly, I had no expectations. I didn't know what was going to happen. Right. And people came out of the woodwork. I, I was going to say, you probably opened floodgates that you didn't know were going to open. <laughs> exactly. I just didn't know. Um, yeah. And now I, I understand the reason is because this is a secret problem. Mm -hmm. uh, people, one, don't necessarily understand that this is happening to them. And so wait, they'll go online and, and read about it and say, oh, my gosh, this is me. Um, so that's one thing. And also, it's something that people just keep to themselves. Yeah. Women in particular, I think, feel so alone with this problem, so isolated and ashamed, and that there's something wrong with them. And so when they see that, boy, there's somebody I could go and talk to about this, and she'll understand, and she won't judge me, it was like, wow, let me yeah. go talk to somebody. Yeah, it's interesting because you already have guilt and shame have been used to control you as the daughter of narcissistic mother that's been utilized as a weapon your whole life and then you get the guilt and shame of oh my gosh I'm saying things about my mother mm -hmm. absolutely and that is not something that is really uh considered a good thing to do in our society right right oh uh, absolutely you do not speak out you can talk negatively or or you know the truth about what's happening with your dad mm -hmm. but if you talk about mom oh you have you have uh, gone you know you have broken through some holy grail that you shouldn't have gone near yeah right that's really um taboo yep so um even though we might see it done in a comic way in tv shows and things like that it's, it's not something um, we do really seriously. And so, so many women come in and, you know, the hallmark it is that they tell me I wake up and I just hear this critical voice in my head and it just plays all day long. Um, the critical voice of my mother, I can't get it out of my head. And, um, and that affects how they feel about themselves, their self-esteem, they doubt themselves. Often they isolate, you know, from other women. Um, it's hard for them to connect because they just feel so different. Um, and then that, that leads to depression and, and particularly anxiety and a host of other issues that then we proceed to uh, work on in therapy. Right. So that's been, that's been sort of my, my journey with it. And then ultimately... Um, even though I started out really reaching out to daughters of narcissistic mothers, I found that many other people came in as well, whether or not they had a, a spouse or a former spouse or even, um, you know, an Boyfriend in -law, or a friend, yeah. Right, or a boss. That's very common as well. Right. Um, so it's been, a, for me, it's been a really interesting and rewarding journey. What's interesting to me is, um, you know, when we talk about this as often, it's generational. So mm -hmm. my mother's mother was very extremely narcissistic to the personality disordered level. Then that affects my mother and how she parents me. Um, that there, some of that bleeds into how I parent my son. You know, I'm just giving an example of, you know, how that happens, as you already know, through lifetimes. And you, you can move through that if the person is willing, but they have to be willing to face the, the childhood wounds that they um, are not wanting to face by staying stuck as that child 
who's operating in an adult body. Mm -hmm. And it's a very difficult journey, but I, I, and I never want to give false hope to anyone that's listening because there are so many schools of thought with this, that, you know, once someone is, has a personality disorder like this, they can never change. There's no hope. Um, and, and oftentimes I never wanted to perpetuate the belief that there is because, um, sometimes you're in a very abusive situation and you don't, and people will cling to any belief that it's going to get better and you, and they need to get out. So it's been really interesting for me to ride the crest of, okay, there can be change. Sometimes it is slow moving, Mm -hmm. but there's so much work that you've got to do on yourself in your reactions to how, you know, a narcissistic parent behaves so that you, because you've decided you're going to stick in the relationship with them. And I think a lot of people don't really understand like what a, an enigma of a dynamic that is. That's right. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And so, you know, one of the things we really work on is, is first education about, about narcissism, understanding what it is, how it shows up, the different styles, because it's certainly, that is not something people talk about. And, and then really helping the person, you know, who is in the, who's coming to therapy, as you said, really learn to manage their own emotions. Because when you are, you know, in a relationship with a narcissist, it's so easily you know, in psychology, as you know, we call it getting emotionally dysregulated, right? Right. right. Because, you know, when you, when they make you doubt your own reality and are so critical, um, the whole, your whole emotional foundation is shaken. So learning to trust yourself and handle your emotions and learning to set healthy boundaries and limits Right. Uh, and when you have been raised by someone who's narcissistic, who they didn't get any boundaries as a kid with their mom, it, I, you know, they don't know where they end and their mother began. And then they raise a child that way. Learning to have healthy boundaries is a firewalk. That's right. <laughs> like, what's a boundary? I have no idea what that is. Right. I, I have no idea. Right. So you have to be able to really learn those those skills and those capacities and feel that you're entitled to them. I think before you can figure out, you know, can I have some type of relationship that will feel safe and healthy to me? Right. I, I attribute, I can now say no without having to go to that pendulum swing, which I did for many years where my no just became so loud and over, you know, over the top because I had never said no. So Mm -hmm. that happened Then I learned, okay, well, you don't have to yell it. You don't have to kill an ant with a, um, you know, with a sledgehammer. (laughs) Yeah. Sledgehammer. You can kill it with a tack hammer, that kind of thing. But coming back to that place where your, your no is there because of that guilt and shame that gets interwoven so much. That's part of that mother experience. The feeling guilty for saying no is what mm-hmm. is what still can get me mm-hmm. like, Oh, I said no. And it was with someone that's completely needs to be told no, but I'm going to feel really guilty about it for a couple of weeks and, and just go over and over it and torture myself, which isn't very kind to myself. So I'm still working on that. And that's for you listeners. Cause when I brought up that we were doing this show, some people emailed that to me and said, ask her about the guilt about saying no. How do we let go of that? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that's a, that's a really great question. So um, I can certainly, and boy, it, it, it's not easy, right? Right. Because the guilt goes back to, well, many different things. And of course, depending on the, on the person, but it goes back to, I should be a good daughter and what should I do? And hearing that voice in your head that, you know, so often when you're raised with a, a narcissistic mother, you're often treated with this. Um, so many women I work with describe feeling treated with this kind of contempt, right? Yeah. If you don't do what I do, then you're just bad. Yeah. Um, it's not up so, to their standards. If, yeah, I, not, I, if I never have to hear any uh, the word standard again, I'll be a happy person. <laughs> yeah. 
That's right. <laughs> well, unless they're your standards, right? Right, exactly. Which is yet another, what? Okay, what? What, what you're striving for. Right. And I would actually, and I'll, I'll get back to the question, what I would love to do and what another thing that we work on is maybe replacing the a whole idea. And I'd love for your, this would be a great takeaway for your listeners to replace the idea of standards maybe with values. Mm. Um, so what values are guiding your life? So I think this is something that can be very helpful, Kristen, when it comes to that, that guilt problem. Okay. Right. So, and this is something they emphasize a lot in ACT, um, acceptance and commitment therapy and in positive psychology. So if you think about what are the values that are most important to you, and you can even, it's great, you can even go online and Google, you know, lists of of values. Mm. So if your value is, um, you know, staying calm for your family, having a peaceful home life, um, you know, doing a good job at work, you know, there's so many different values, living according to treating people with dignity, things like that. Right. If you can, then you can say to yourself, well, if I do this for my mother, and then that's going to stress me out so that, that maybe I come home and eat, without even wanting to snap at somebody, is that going to really be living towards my values? Right. So that I think is one good guideline. Um, right. And, and saying they're your values. You're right. Standard is so just, it, carry, it can carry this weight of, of shame with it. Of Those are my standards, but values is so much more intrinsic to our basic needs and who we are as a human being that I think it's a softer word to use. Like I am allowed to have values. Absolutely. Right. And they're my own. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And values have to do with how we go about the world, how we treat other people. Um, So I think that I I find that a very useful tool or practice. And one of the things I really try to, you know, live by, it's not easy, um, and, and teach other people is that these are all practices. Um, you know, and these are all practices, things that we work on every day. Um, none of these are one and done. Right. Right. It's a, it's a lifelong journey. Have you, have you noticed with, uh, people that were raised, you know, in that kind of an environment and I'm, you know, oftentimes it's a lot of trauma going on that creates that too. And, that there can be moments like let's say right now when we're in the middle of this pandemic where maybe you've come to a really good place with your, your narcissistic mother and your own narcissism that you've, you know, had with your children. And then all of a sudden something like this happens and it really tests all the skill building that you've done to, to manage it. Oh, absolutely. And I was, I, I've been, thinking about that, um, and this might be coming up for some of your listeners, that for example, um, for some women, you know, the best path might be to go no contact, right? I mean, that might have be a choice that they, they made. And now we have this, epi- you know, this pandemic. Right. And perhaps, um, they're wondering, especially if they have an elderly parent, you know, should I be reaching out to them? You know, what should I do? Right. Um, and that's going to be testing, you know, a decision that they made that was, that was healthy, healthy for them and wondering if that's going to open up Pandora's box. Right. When they're already stressed about what's happening and then we're going to add all that stuff that you could put into um, a box and put on a shelf because you're no contact. Um, right. And now we're going to add that stress on top of already being freaked out. Yeah. I totally get what you're saying. Yeah. Or if you're just someone who, who works very hard as you know, we all do, cause I said, these are practices, 
you know, to manage your anxiety, to manage your, that critical voice in your head. Am I making the right choices? Am I doing the right things? And that, that voice is going to pop up even, even more, you know, you didn't clean enough. Um, uh, you didn't really, you know, stand six feet away from that person, things like that. Um, or what if you lose your job? You know, they don't, oh. they don't, you don't really do a good job, to do a good job there. You know, you could be the first one. So many people are, are so worried about their, their well-being, things like that. Yeah, I did have um, uh, a listener tell me that they, they did get back in contact at, at, because of what's going on. And, you know, that's very limited and very managed. But they had come in contact with uh, someone who was infected and not close contact or anything, but all of a sudden the barrage of you need to demand a test, you need to be calling every medical professional, you need to be blah, blah, blah. And they had to go, okay, stop. I'm not taking a test away from someone else who might really need it, especially when I don't have any symptoms, Hmm. you know, like this onslaught of shame and how irresponsible, you know, you are that you are not going and demanding that when you know, the reality is there aren't enough tests available. So I, you know, that they can call and, and scream at a, a million medical professionals who don't need to be screamed at right now, and they still aren't going to get a test. That's right. The doctors make that decision. That's yeah. right. And, but it must feel so awful because what do you need if you've been at that moment in your life? Empathy, right? right. You just need empathy. I'm sorry that happened. You must, maybe you feel worried about that. You know, how can I help you? But that's not what you get from a narcissistic mother, right? Right, right. And I think that's something that all daughters of narcissistic mothers share is a longing for empathy, which just does not come or may come depending on, you know, the level of disturbance in the parent which comes sporadically. Uh. Yes, it's the sporadic piece that can be, that when I've talked about this with friends, that some of them go, oh, I'll never get that from my mother, so I just know. And then I have other friends in my own experience, which is sometimes you get the most, you know, this well of empathy and that craving that you've always wanted from your mother, but don't rest, like you almost can't rest in that because something else can happen and then you're going to get the ice pick, you know, and you, and you, so you always are just sort of on guard with, okay, well, I'm enjoying this well of empathy that I'm getting about this situation, but I'm not going to let that fool me into or lull me into a state that I won't get the other at some point. (laughs) That's right. That's right. And that is a recipe for anxiety. Yes. Um, You know, to have to be um, vigilant, um, on guard, not being able, and a recipe for, you know, difficulties trusting, right? Absolutely. It does. It makes you be so hyper aware in, in any kind of a new situation. I'm, I'm always psychologically scoping out the, you know, the playing field in any new situation. I can't help it. It's, uh, and I, I can, I can be aware of it, which I am, but I do it in such a hypervigilant way because that's what I had to do my entire childhood. Right. We had to, we had to be tuned in, right? Oh yeah. Yes. We had to be tuned in. And and I think, you know, I think it can make us, um, you know, most of the women who come into my, my practice are incredibly empathetic, so empathetic to other people. And um, many of us become therapists ourselves <laughs> because that was a skill that was, that was honed. I'm not saying it's good, believe me. I wouldn't wish <laughs> raised by a narcissist to parent on anybody. But when you, for many people, you can, you can learn to become very empathetic to other people because you grow up tuned into other people's feelings. Right, right. And some of it was to learn how to protect yourself because being tuned into someone else's feelings was a way for you to know when they were going to go off the rails. Oh, absolutely. It was a a survival strategy. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm. It's such an interesting (laughs) 
experience to, to go through that and to walk through it. And there's so many commonalities that survivors can talk about with each other. And yet each one also has its own distinct flavors. Mm -hmm. That's right. And um, so that's why it's so important, you know, to listen, you know, to everybody's story, find out, um, you know, even though my goal and my practice is to really help people, you know, thrive and move forward and, and learn skills, uh, people have to tell their stories, right? People have to feel under, understood and, and empathized with in, in order to be able to, to move on. Right, in order to be able to heal. You know, as we close this show, when you're working with a daughter of a narcissistic mother, um, how are you, and I know it's probably unique to everything, but that commonality of, of symptoms, the shame that someone carries with them, the hypervigilance, the being an extremely empathetic person, how does that process of getting them to feel empowered in the fact that they're so empathetic instead of, oh, you're just too sensitive? Mm, you're too sensitive, right? Yeah. So when you when you're narrow when you're you know doing your work and you're guiding someone to that place of feeling what it's like to be empowered about these gifts instead of ashamed. When do you sort of get that light bulb moment for you as a therapist going, okay, they're starting to get it? Mm. Well, one of the things that I really try to get people to focus on um, pretty quickly is focusing on, you know, their strengths and the times that they already and the zones in their life where they already feel like their best selves. Because no matter how bad somebody feels when they come in, if you really create a calm, quiet environment after a while, they can already start to tune into where they already start to feel like their best self, even a little bit. Okay. And then you, they, you help them amplify that and grow that part of themselves. So there's a little bit of, if it's not broken, don't fix it. And I'll give you an example. So, you know, a woman I work with now um, who came from a a very athletic family, okay? But she did not want to be, she was not athletic. She was more artistic. And so that she was just not really valued in her family. But now, um, you know, she wasn't a jock. So now as an adult... She's taking art classes. And Mm. when she is there with the other artists, she just feels like a million bucks and she gets great feedback. And she just, you know, she goes into the zone when she's painting or doing pottery. And and she didn't even realize that until we really started talking about it and she really thought about it. And so that's where sort of her family and issues can almost sort of float away. Okay. And you want to help her build on how she feels inside when she's there and then be able to start to almost transfer that to other parts of her life. Does that make sense? It makes absolute sense. And I just thought of something else really important that actually a listener had asked me about. How do you, you know, when you, you have these uh, children come in, these adult children come in and they're very wounded and then you're this loving, boundaried, accepting place for them. How do you manage that transference that's going to happen? Mm. You know, uh, especially around the the mother wound. Mm. You know, you know, that's a, that's a good question. Um, You know, I am, I am warm, I am open, but you know, I do, I do keep the boundaries there. I really try to keep the focus on them. And, um, so, you know, and it's different with everybody. Yes, some people do get more needy and calling me in between. And, you know, we talk about it and try to keep those, you know, talk about the need for those boundaries and, and what's coming right. up for them. And and it really depends on, on the person. On each person. Gotcha. Because yeah. it does happen. I know for me, when I saw um, a psychologist to just deal with this, she became 
you know, that cheerleader mother figure for me. And when a friend of mine that also saw her said, boy, she doesn't do that stuff with me. I know enough because of how many people I've interviewed, you know, over the last eight years, I went, oh, she's being that for me because she knows that's what I need. Got very well boundaried, of course, but it just, I, it woke me up to, okay, she's not motherly and nurturing to every client. She's giving that to me because I really need it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So I I think people do need that, you know, and it will, it will vary. Some people might get angry if, if I can't give enough, some people will reach out for that and realize, oh, that's too much, too much what I'm asking. You know, we, so we just try to talk about it if they're, if they're able. Mm. Well, Stephanie, please tell our listeners, because you're, trust me when I say you're going to get some phone calls <laughs> from when this show goes out, but um, tell our listeners where they can find out more about you. Okay. Well, it's been a great conversation. Um, my website, and it is long because I have a long name. Um, it's Dr. D, as in David R, Stephanie, S T E P H A N. I E Kreisberg, K R I E S is in Sam, B is in boy, E R G dot com. And then my email is Dr. S K at Dr. Stephanie Kreisberg dot com. Mm. And they can always call me to 781 507 3421. And I would love to hear from people. Fantastic. Well, questions, comments, whatever. Yeah, exactly. Thank you so much for reaching out to us and coming on the show. And, um, and especially during what's a very trying time for everyone on the planet. (laughs) Yes. And I wish everyone on the, the best stay safe, stay healthy, and just take care of yourselves. Absolutely. And listeners, thank you for tuning in to another episode of Mental Health News Radio. Hi, listeners. I'll make it quick. These are some really cool places that give discounts and other cool things for listeners of Mental Health News Radio Network. If you want to get amazing help with healing from narcissistic abuse, go to healfromanarcissist.com. If you want CBD products that are the best of the best, I use them myself, go to pros, P-R-O-Z-E dot com and use the code mentalhealth20, mentalhealth20. If you want to get daily perk ups that help retrain your brain to think more positively, go to perkupdaily.com. And also, just because this one's fun, snarkycandles.com. I guarantee you'll love them. Snarky with a Y, S N A R K Y, candles.com. And don't forget, if you want to hear all the shows on the network about first responders, you can go to firstrespondermentalhealthnetwork.com and all of our shows that focus on narcissistic abuse, narcissisticabusehealingnetwork.com. Thanks for listening and back to the show. Without good intentions, I heat up and act on my emotions. Thanks so much for listening to Mental Health News Radio. Our podcast can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, and hundreds of other podcast apps. Or you can visit our website at mentalhealthnewsradio.com. If you have a question or would like to be a guest, become a podcaster on our network, or join the amazing organizations that help keep us on the air, please email us at info at mhnrnetwork.com. Get ready for that special goodbye from our resident therapy dog, Miles, and a special thanks to Emily Sohn for letting us use her incredible song, Cordial, for our podcast music. Listen to the full song on SoundCloud at emily.sonne. Don't be surprised when I don't hate on you. After all we promised, we'd be cordial. Sometimes in you I can find it. Good boy.